morning, Cornerstone family. Let's all stand as we begin to worship God this morning. I'm just going to read a verse, a couple of verses this morning as we come into worship with God. Colossians 3, 14 through 17 says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That was Colossians 3, 14 through 17. As we join together and praise God this morning, you see that we have acoustic worship this morning. It's just the piano and the guitar and our voices. We just want to focus on the heart of worship this morning as we just um, lift up these songs. And sometimes we get distracted by a lot of the noise and all of the, we tend to get used to the same routine and we want to just change it up this morning. So if you would lift up your voices, if you would sing out these songs, and just focus on the heart in connecting with our God this morning. Let's worship Him. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you Sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Sing this together, King of Endless Work. King of Endless Work. you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath Yeah I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you all 
goodness today. what we are in life. When we worship God, we've got to focus on what He's doing and who He is. Sometimes we get distracted by what we're doing in worship. You know, am I singing out loud? Am I singing out the wrong notes? Am I playing the wrong notes? Even if we're in our own rooms, then maybe we're, we're distracted on our own problems or situations. And we start to focus on, God, I need you in this. But this is worship to God for who he is. Because when we declare who he is, he begins to reveal himself clearly in our situations and what he's going to do. And his plans are greater than ours. His will is above ours. So we could align ourselves with his will. Amen. He is a great God. He is a loving God. He knows each and every one of us and our hearts. As we pour out our worship to him, let's be reminded of this, his goodness that keeps running after us no matter how far we run away from him. He keeps calling us to him at his feet that we would worship him in spirit and in truth. So God, we worship you. We give you our worship. Thank you for the breath in our lungs that we were repeat to you Jesus these words we sing out to you with the breath in our lungs return back to you in worship and praise you give life you are love you bring life to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord let's sing that again you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your
Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we sing this with that confidence and knowing that, that our loved ones would come to know him and that we would know him more and more. Sing all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing.
family, would you pray with me? God, we bring before you this morning the best that our voices can offer. <laughs> Lord, what an incredible song. Because we've got nothing else that we, can, that we got. Lord, it's just the breath that we have, the songs that we sing, the notes that we play, the, the tunes that we lift before you, God. We pray that in this moment, Lord, you would receive them. God, as an offering, as a moment of praise, as a recognition of worship, God, that these things would come before you in this moment, and God, that they would please you. Lord, it doesn't matter how good we can sing, I pray that the posture of our hearts would be right. So God, we lift our minds and our hearts to you now. God, that with our voices, that we would lift ourselves, our beings to you, God, that you would receive our focus of you, our worship of you in this moment and in this place. Jesus, we pray and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Church family, you may be seated. I want to welcome you to Cornerstone Miami. My name is Dave and I'm part of the team here. If you're visiting with us, we're so honored that you've chosen to join us for this Thanksgiving week. In fact, when you walked in, you were probably handed one of these. It's called a connection card. Let me encourage you to fill this out. And in a moment when we greet each other, I'm going to ask you to take it to that back section over there where it says new here. My friend Mike is there, and we've got a special gift for you. It's our way of saying thank you for visiting with us and being with us today. It's our opportunity to bless you. You know, our goal and our desire to, when we gather is to teach people to trust and obey Jesus uh, in every aspect of life. And so we're hoping that that happens for you. In this moment, before we jump into our announcements, we want to continue the, to worship by the way that we give back to the Lord. I want to read uh, from Psalm 107, verse 1. Here's what the scripture says. It says to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Church, as we put a bow on Thanksgiving and prepare our minds and our hearts for Christmas, I pray that you would realize that being thankful isn't something that happens merely in November. But every moment that we have life, every opportunity that we have breath, every day, church family, is a day that we don't deserve. It's evidence of God's goodness, his mercy, and his grace towards you and towards me, which is why the scripture says we've been called to give thanks. One of the ways we do that is by the way that we give back to him. Not because we're obligated and not because we're forced to, but how else can we say thank you, God, for providing for us? in simply recognizing that the provision we have, it comes from him first. And so in this moment, we want to invite you to give. The simplest way to do that is, if you're in the house today, there's a basket in the back, you can give there. For those of you who prefer to give online or through text, there's a bunch of different ways for you to go. However you choose to give thanks to the Lord, because he is good, let me just say on behalf of our church, thank you for doing that. Let's pray and then we'll continue. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to respond to you, Lord, and to give thanks. And so, Father, we pray that you would receive these gifts, not because we, we're trying to buy anything or we're trying to earn anything, but, Lord, simply as a recognition that, God, everything that we have, it comes from you. What more else could we do with our songs and with our praise and with our giving but, God, say thanks to you? And so, Jesus, we ask that you would receive that in this moment. We pray, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, listen, as I did mention, Thanksgiving is, is just wrapping up, and, and we're getting ready to move into this brand new season. It's Christmas time. I'm not sure if you're excited, but, man, me and Buddy Elf are always excited about Christmas time. And so one of the things that we've got coming up, and I just want to call your attention to it, because it's happening December 9th. It's home for the holidays. Last year, we did an, a Christmas outreach that we hosted back here in our backyard. So this year, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to host it across the street. Say that with me, across the street. Believe it or not, there's, a, there's a, like an open ranch area. I don't know if you've noticed, but over the last couple of weeks, it's been populated with the most random animals. There's like a gorilla there. There's a plastic giraffe. It's like, what in the world is going on? Here's what's going on. The owner of that property has a couple of children who are autistic. That is their legacy to their kids. And so you saw pumpkin patches for sale and a bunch of other things. 
It's all to raise awareness for autism. So they're bringing a ton of people in our local community to the gorillas and to the giraffes and to the elephant. And so a few weeks ago, we walked over and we said, hey, for Christmas, we host an event back here. Can we host it over there? And they said, absolutely. And so I want you to know that on December 9th, our choir is going to be singing. We're going to be sharing the gospel. Santa is going to be there to take pictures. Christmas train is going to be there. They're going to be bringing their friends. And listen, I'm going to ask you to bring your friends too. You can scan the QR code to get more details, but make sure you don't forget that December 9th is coming up. Next Sunday is our first Sunday of the, of the month, so as is the custom, we celebrate communion. So let me encourage you to come, prepare your minds and hearts to receive what we're calling our Christmas communion. Also want to remind you that we have a brand new Christmas series starting next week as well. It's called The Thrill of Hope. I mean, it's just going to be an incredible time as we recognize the promise of Jesus, his coming and his birth. I don't know about you, but man, if ever there's been a time where we could go with a little bit more hope, Listen, this is that time. And I just want you to know, I want to stress that for the next four weeks as we start this series, man, there's going to be a clear emphasis, not just on Christmas, the point of Christmas, but on Jesus, why he came. And for all of those who need hope, this is going to be that place. So let me encourage you to bring your friends and family to join us. Now, with that being said, I want to go ahead and call attention to our little ones who are in this room, our elementary age kids. You guys are going to be leaving, I believe, with Mr. Dom, who's standing in the back. And so as our little ones exit, would you affirm their spiritual formation in this moment? And for everyone else, let me invite you to stand, greet each other, and welcome to Cornerstone Miami. All right, family, good morning, good morning. Hey, I'm gonna invite my friend Marquis to come up on stage. I just wanted to, to let you know every now and then, um, actually, no, that's not true. We have different teachers who speak in our church. And, and the reason we do that, it's, for, it's built like that on purpose. Number one is there's one central person in this church and his name is Jesus, right? Amen? Amen. Oh, that was awful. Amen. There's one central person in this church and his name is Jesus. Amen. All right. Now, that being said, we also know that Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, uh, gives different gifts to different people within the church. And so I'm not the only one. Mike is not the only one. So over the next few weeks and months, you're going to see others who are going to be sharing. Today, our brother Marquis is going to be sharing for the first time. He's our middle school and high school director. So at first, I just wanted to make sure you know who is this guy and what's he doing. And then number two, would you affirm him and welcome him in this moment? Thank you, brother. Go get it. I am so excited. Thank you guys so much for giving me this opportunity and privilege. Would you guys stand with me as we read God's word? 
We just concluded our series in Proverbs today. We're going to be in Psalm 100. Um, this psalm is five verses long. Today, we're just going to consider the first three verses with our time this morning. So if you guys don't have your Bibles, it'll be in the screen. You can follow along with me. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, let's do it. A psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord he is God. Can you guys say, he is God? He is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so, so much, Lord, because you are God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to come together and to hear your word and to worship you this morning. I ask and pray for our time as we're in your word and um, as we're looking at Psalm 100, God, would you just show us what your word has to share for us this morning? Lord, all of us are in need of your goodness. All of us are in need of your mercy and your grace. So I pray, Lord, that it is your voice, not mine this morning, that is being spoken and heard. I pray, Lord, that you show us what we need, instruction from your word this morning to take with us into our everyday lives, Lord. So be with us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. If you guys walked in, you guys got one of these, would encourage you guys, if you have one, there's a section where you can take notes. I want to encourage you guys to take notes with us this morning. I want to tell you a quick story. Um, a lot of you guys know I'm a big football fan. Yeah? Um, I'm not going to speak about the team that I root for because they're a little bit embarrassing right now, but I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about my time when I played football because in high school, freshman year was the first time I ever played football. I mean, tackle football where you put on some pads and you put on some helmet. It was the first time that I've ever experienced an environment like that. And I remember in, in the summer going into practice and actually trying out for the team. And thankfully, I made the team. But I just remember that freshman season. It was one of the worst seasons I've ever experienced in sports. I mean, just terrible. We lost every single game. Practices weren't fun. But really, what made that season so awful was our coach was bad. Everyone have ever played with a terrible coach before or had a terrible coach in anything, whether it's sports or instruments or whatever. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. This coach had no idea what he was doing. And, you know, he, not to offend anybody, but, you know, he was a little bit on the older side, you know. And um, he kind of lost touch with everybody, could not relate, tried to play this old school brand of football that we just weren't up for it completely lost the locker room. I've never seen so many people quit football in one season. I've never seen so many people give up. Kids are coming in there with a dream to go to college and to get a scholarship, and he just ruined the game for all of us. It was not fun to play football. So I go through the season, I endured, and our school fired the coach. You see, our school, we didn't have a winning record for about a decade. It was time for that guy to get booted, you know? It was time for him to go. And so our school fires the coach, and they bring in this new one. And I remember that um, when this new coach came in, we had an informational team meeting. This was towards the end of the freshman year. And he calls everybody after school into the auditorium, and we're all sitting there. It's about 80 to 100 of us, JV and varsity football players. And he comes up on the stage, and he says, my name is Coach Hafley. I won a state championship with Blanche Ely High School. I played Division I football at the University of Clemson. I became a high school football coach, won district championships, took my team to the playoffs. And I am your new head football coach. And I remember like the whole room was just in awe of this guy. You see, here's what happened. This new head football coach came in and let us know directly who he was. And the moment that we understood who this guy was, instantly we believed. Instantly we trusted. Instantly we were ready to get back on the field. Instantly we wanted to put pads back on and helmets back on and start hitting people and playing football. And I remember our first practice, everybody was excited. A culture of winning was developed. Football was finally fun again. It was exciting to actually want to go to practice, go to the weight room, heck, even go to study hall, right? 
Like, we all wanted to do that because we believed in this coach. And what this coach told us is that if you want to go to college, I know how to get there. I know how to develop players to get to college. So if you do what I say and trust in my principles, I got you. You're going to play college football. And from then on, our team started to develop a culture of winning. And within a year, our team made the playoffs for the first time in 15 years. Everything changed. You see, here's why I'm telling you this. Because it's a general rule in life that when we have great knowledge of something, usually it creates some, side, um, some sort of emotion. When we have an understanding of something or of someone, it usually creates a positive emotion. And what we do with those emotions is we turn that into a response. We turn that into an action. It's a rule of life. And when we know something, we feel something, and because we feel something based off of what we know, now we want to do something in response. Inspiration, knowledge of something, leads to transformation, doing something in response. But you see, here's the thing. When we read the Bible, there's moments where the Bible calls us to feel a certain way because of who God is. Sometimes we just don't feel that, right? Right? Like there are moments where we ought to feel something good because God is good. But we look at life right now, and we just don't feel that. Life will always do what life does, right? Life will always bring a mess into our life, and especially when we never ask for life to hit us. We never ask for life to actually bring some circumstances that we don't want to deal with. But life will do what life always does. And these always causes emotion. And the interesting thing is that we're entering the holiday season, right? We just finished celebrating Thanksgiving, and now we're going into the Christmas season. And the holiday season, it's like a conflict of emotion, right? Because what it tells us to feel is joy. It tells us to feel happiness. It, it, it allows us to look forward to being with family. But man, stress increases, though. You look at psychological reports, and anxiety and depression are going up during the holiday season. The joy has been lost. Man, it's great to actually go into the holiday season and spend great time with our families, but then life hits us and my marriage is falling apart. I want my kids not be the way that I want my kids to be. It's time of giving, right? To bring everybody gifts, but yo, I'm living in Miami and I can't afford this life anymore. My finances are messed up. So how is it that when we read scripture, we're supposed to have joy? We're supposed to feel thankful and be thankful. But we look at life right now and our circumstances, and we just can't. And here's the thing that the Bible teaches, is that knowing who God is and what he has done for us, right, the inspiration, the knowledge of who God is, will cause his people to respond, transformation, Knowing the truth about something that causes emotion and based off of those emotion leads to a response. We call this worship. Here's what I want us to understand this morning. Is that when we truly know who God is, then we give thanks to him for what he has done and we worship him for who he is. I'm going to say that one more time. Because if there's one thing I want you guys to leave with this morning, it's this right here. When we truly know who God is, I mean truly know who God is, then we can give thanks to him for what he has done and worship him for who he is. So we're in Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Let's, let's talk about Psalm 100 for, for just a moment because Psalm 100 is actually pretty unique. I don't know if you guys knew this about Psalm 100, but it's the only psalm in all of the psalms, there's 150 of them, with the title, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. It's the only one with that kind of title. And, and if you actually read Psalm 100, we realize that it's really a psalm about worship. Right, like the response and what the, what the psalmist David is trying to lead his people to understanding is how good God is and how we should respond in worship. And so the idea of the title being a psalm of thanksgiving, but the psalm really being about worship, teaches us that thanksgiving, when understood right, when practiced well, when it's rooted into our hearts, 
will cause us to worship. One of the greatest forms of thanksgiving to God is worship. And so what David does in this psalm with this unique structure is he'll tell us what to do and ways to feel. And then he'll go on and tell us why we do those things and why we should feel those things. What to do actions, but why we do it is the knowledge. Inspiration leading to transformation. So this morning I want to look at two headings. The first one is the things to do and the ways to feel. And the second one, why we do and how to feel. So let's first consider things to do and ways to feel. Let's look at Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. It says this, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Everyone say all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Everyone say gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Here's what we are told to do, according to David. To make a joyful noise and to serve with gladness and to come into his presence with singing. I want you to come on stage with me. You're awesome. <laughs> well, here's what David is doing, right? He's calling us to a posture of worship, a call to do something and how to do it. So let's first consider a call to make a joyful noise, right? A call to make a joyful noise is referring to our volume of worship, right? Our volume of worship. In other words, our worship should be audible, our worship should be heard, that all the earth should worship as one and everybody hears each other in worship. This word shout or noise refers to a coronation ceremony. If you were to understand this word in the Hebrew, it would, it would mean or it, it would like kind of represent a king coming and the receiving of a new king. Or maybe in our context today, think of it like when a president is sworn into office and the celebration of that moment, the, the joyful noise that is happening in those moments. And notice at the end of verse 2, it says to come into his presence with singing. And so what David is uh, trying to paint here is a picture of celebration, a picture of joy. You got to understand, like, events like that, like the receiving of a new king and presidents being sworn into office, like, those are no quiet events. You got thousands of people and everybody's making noises and everybody's celebrating. And everybody is shouting with joy. You have music. You have parades. There's a fanfare. Everything is involved. Can you picture the excitement of when the people of God come together in that fashion, making a joyful noise? coming into his presence with singing. A scene that is clear that we are celebrating something. I want you to think of a concert for a moment. I have a picture up on a screen. Think of a concert. How many of you guys been to a concert? A lot of us been to a concert. Imagine Hard Rock Stadium being sold out. Thousands upon thousands of people. You got artists. I don't know. Let's pick a famous artist that sold out hard rock. I don't know. Bad Bunny, you know. I don't encourage anyone to listen to Bad Bunny. It was just the first one that came to my mind. But Bad Bunny recently sold out Hard Rock Stadium. And you got all these people coming to see Bad Bunny. You got all these people singing with joy all of Bad Bunny's terrible music. But imagine the scene of a concert that people are paying to sing to someone their own song. Can you picture the joy of people? Can you picture the smile on their faces as they're enjoying the concert? You know what I find funny about concerts? People sing louder in concerts than the church would ever sing loud for Jesus. Like, I just feel like the church who is actually celebrating something that is great, 
I mean, we're celebrating a Lord who is alive. We are celebrating a Lord who has risen. We are celebrating the fact that the cross is empty and the grave is no more and the church is too quiet. And we got people selling out all these concerts, but where's the joyful noise? Where is the singing from the church? Is it audible? And it, let's go back to the concert for a moment. Have you ever been to a concert to an artist that you're unfamiliar with? Like you just got invited to this concert, you don't know who the guy is, but a friend told you, come on, let's go to this concert, right? I know that's happened to me once. And you know what's interesting is that again, stadium is sold out. You're looking around because you're like, you know what? Like, I don't know this guy, but this scene is a vibe, you know? People are singing. People can't even sit down anymore. They're standing for hours and hours and hours, smile on people's faces. You know what that makes me want to do? Like, what is it about that guy that's on the stage that can sell out this entire stadium, that people can sing the way that they're singing for that guy's music? Like, in a moment like that, for me, it, it creates some sort of curiosity. I want to know more. I want to know who that artist is. Like, the other thing about an audible worship is that it's evangelistic in its nature. Right? Like, when the church is visibly worshiping the Lord loud, people come in and see that. They want to know, man, why are they singing like that? Why do they got smiles on their faces? Why are they so joyful in their singing? Why does it feel like a party in here? And I want to know more. Man, who is this Jesus that they're singing about? Who is this Jesus that they're singing to? Man, I want to call us to understand that our worship is evangelistic. People got to see that we're worshiping the Lord. People got to hear us worshiping the Lord. The joy in which we worship. Is it visible? Can people see that? I mean, when you walk to church on Sunday morning, come in from the parking lot, man, is the joy all up in your face ready to celebrate that Jesus is alive? Or are we trying to rush into the building because we're running on Miami time and we're late? And we're not even thinking. We're just trying to get to church on time. I just got to go to church because that's the Christian thing to do every Sunday. Or are we coming to church with a posture ready to worship with joy in our faces so that people can see, you know what, like I want to be here. I want to worship the Lord. I want to celebrate Jesus, not just celebrate on Easter Sunday. Yeah, that's an even greater specialty, right? But no, every Sunday is a celebration church. Every Sunday is a Sunday where we get to remember what Christ has done for us and who he is. Can people see that? Can your friends see that? Do you worship like that, not just on Sunday mornings, but every day in your life? So that's a joyful noise, but I want to call your attention again in verses 1 and 2, we're also told that we are to serve with gladness. So while our joyful noise refers to the volume of our worship, serving with gladness refers to the scope of our worship. The Hebrew word that we see here in Psalm 100 for serve is the word abad. Everyone say abad. Abad. This word not only refers to how the Israelites would serve within the temple, but it would also show how they would serve within their vocation. Here's what Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 tells us. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. You see that same word for work is the same word that we see for serve in Psalm 100, abad. So as the Hebrews would be reading and singing Psalm 100, they would understand this word abad as a comprehensive term. The totality of our service, not just within the church or within the temple for the Jews, but everywhere. Our vocation, our homes. You see, the totality of our worship is beyond church. It's everywhere and every day. 
beyond serving in church. And, you know, like church, we need people to serve. I don't want to say that. It's not important. I think you guys understand that. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. But, man, in our everyday lives, are we serving with gladness? Or do you only understand serving within the context of the church and not within the context of your vocation? You see, Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 to 24 tells us to whatever you do, work heartily. As for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Can I ask you guys a question? How differently would you see your job if you didn't just look at your job as merely working at a store, working in an office, being a teacher? How differently would you see your home if it wasn't just raising your kids? But rather, I'm doing all this because I am serving the Lord. You see, there's something to be said in our worship when we serve the Lord in this way. Because the way that we live life every day, the way that we serve people every day, again, our worship is evangelistic. Let's not forget that. And so in the worship with our volume is evangelistic, but the way that we interact, the way that we serve, the way that we love and care for others is also evangelistic in that way. It draws people to the one whom we worship when worship and serving is understood in this manner. It's not just the songs that we sing as worship. Let's not limit worship to just that. But it's the everyday life and how we serve. It's worship. The way that we live, the way that we work, the way that we study, the way that we raise our children, the way that we honor our spouses. Man, that is worship. But the emphasis is on gladness. So we get the idea of serving. But yo, imagine, imagine going up to somebody how would you respond to this? Like, hey, you know, I care for you, but, you know, you give like a, like, a, like a half attitude, like, you know, like you really don't care for that person, but you're just saying it. Like, yeah, mom, I care for you. I got you. Whatever you need, mom, I got you. Oh, cool. How would that make my own mom feel? And I just give her an attitude like that, talk to her in that way. Right, there's no gladness in my voice. Like, I'll be there for you. But just out of necessity, not because I desire to serve you. You see, like, it's so easy to serve, but is the gladness in our hearts? Is the love for the ones who are serving in our hearts? Is there a desire to serve those people? And so while serving is necessary, the emphasis here is to serve with gladness. Loving people enough with a desire to serve them. How much do you enjoy serving? I gotta be honest, I don't like serving that much, honestly. I mean, at least like the hardcore stuff, like, I don't know, like painting and stuff like that, like service projects is not for me. Can't do it, you know? I I don't know if you guys know this, I work with Youth for Christ and every year we do a camp in Central Florida and there's a a camp that we have called um, uh, project serve. It's, it's a high school camp. I try to avoid it every year because I hear that you got to scrub toilets and stuff. Like, nah, bro, I can't, I can't mess with that, you know? But man, like, it convicts me to hear that our CEO of Youth for Christ, mind you, a CEO sits there and scrub toilets all day. You're just scrubbing toilets. Number one, that's nasty right? But the gladness in which he shares that, the gladness in which he desires to do that was convicting. And it made me realize, like, I need to be like her. That a CEO of a nonprofit organization is willing to serve the Lord with gladness by scrubbing some toilets for a whole week. All she did She did it with gladness. I'm not saying we have to be that extreme, 
But whatever God has put you in, whatever vocation that the Lord has called you to, you may not like it right now. You may be in a season where you don't want to do what you're doing. But until the Lord has you there, the joy in which we understand whom God is would allow us to serve wherever we are, wherever the Lord has put you with gladness. Why? Because the Lord has put you there for a purpose. The Lord has put you there, perhaps to make an eternal impact on somebody. So, man, we got to love people enough to even do the dirty work like scrubbing toilets. But we got to do it with gladness. Amen? So that's things to do and ways to feel. Now let's talk about why we do and how to feel. Look at verse 3 of Psalm 100. Know that the Lord... He is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Let's talk about this word no for just a moment. The Hebrew word for no here in this passage is the word yada. Everyone say yada. I hope I said that right. Yada. This word yada is not just like a no, like, yo, I know the sky is blue. I know that your, your shirt is green or teal. It's not this general fact, especially with no real significance in our life. That's not the word yada here. But the word yada is to know by perceiving and seeing. It means to really find out who God is for himself and to know him through a personal experience. I mean, it's to really know something personally, intimately, to know through experience. You see, what David the psalmist is calling us to do here is to know. And in this verse, he's going to unpack what knowing God, yada, God, really means. But what we have to understand is that our worship is not in accordance to how we feel. It's in accordance to what we know. That's what Yada is telling us, is that in order to worship with joy and in order to serve with gladness, it's not, you know what, I'll do that when I feel joyful or when I feel glad, but no, it's to do that because I know who God is. Inspiration leads to transformation. A knowing that causes an emotion which then leads to a response of worship. How is the Lord God? Well, David tells us that he's a creator. He is the creator, which means if he is the creator, then we are his creation. You got to understand what David is saying is God is up here and we're down here. We don't match. He's the creator and we are the creation He is the maker of everything, the universe, the earth, humanity. And we, who have been made by him, guess what? We're his. We belong to him. He created us. He made us. means we are his. He created the world and all that is in it, which means that too is his. The text says that we are his people. You got to understand that something about God is that God doesn't depend on us. When God created us, he didn't need us in creation. But the reason that he created us was within this great love within himself that poured out into creation, which poured out into him creating humanity. But we have to understand where we stand in all this. This God loved us and his love poured out into creation, but he is still God. And we are still his creation and we are still his. Now, because of that, that God lovingly created us, you got to understand now that by grace and his love, we still exist today. Which means that God is the author of life. He created Life, because of God's grace and mercy, all of us are still living today. It means that we exist through God, and outside of God, there is no life. 
And true life cannot be found outside of God, both physically and spiritually. That's why Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6, told us that I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. Come on, guys. I, he is the what? Life. life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. He is the author and the giver of life. But because God created us, it means that he also sustains us, right? Because God loves us so much, he's not just going to create us and leave us there to figure it out. Right? Like God and his love through creation demonstrates that through the sustaining of his creation. That's why David goes on to say that we are the sheep of his pasture. In other words, that he is the good shepherd. He cares for his creation. He cares for his sheep. He provides for his people. The land where we graze as sheep is his. All of the provision that we receive come from him. The care and the protection that we have, it is because of him. We are his sheep and he is our shepherd. He is the good shepherd. Here's what David is saying by calling God the creator and by calling God the good shepherd. What David is saying is that God is sovereign. This word sovereign means of ultimate control. Like if you are the head of your household, you are sovereign over your household. What, what, what David is saying is that God, the creator of the universe and the earth and humanity, he is in control. He's the one that provides. He's the one that sustains. He's the one that cares. He's the one that gives us the provision. So in other words, he is in control. He rules. He is sovereign. Everything is God's. Everything is his. We are his. The earth is his. And guess what? Our worship is his. As the good shepherd, he has come to gather us. He has come to guide us. And he has come to give us life. I love this because Jesus in John chapter 10 explains himself so beautifully. Let me read it to you. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go, on, go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. I didn't hear an amen there, right? Jesus is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Man, that's why we're celebrating, right? That's why we worship, right? What David is saying in Psalm 100, Jesus fulfilled that in his life, in his ministry. Jesus completed the picture that David began to write about. Inspiration, knowing who God is, knowing who Jesus is as the creator, as the good shepherd, leads to this transformation of worship. Knowing who he is and what he has done for us is why we are here. This is what we call, ladies and gentlemen, the good news of the gospel. That we have been created by a loving God. Whom we have life through him. But because of our sin, we've messed up and we've separated ourselves from a holy God. And so there's a problem because God loves us, God creates us, but because of our sin, because of our imperfection, because we are not holy like he is holy, we're separated from God. So how can a God who loves us, creates us, who gives us life, be with people who are not like him and are separated from him? How do we fill this gap? The answer was through the person of Jesus. The answer was that Jesus was the only human being to ever walk this earth 
who was not like us, but was everything who God the Father is, who walked this earth, lived a perfect life, was a perfect sacrifice on the cross because he didn't sin. He didn't make a mistake. He's holy like God is holy. And he took himself lovingly to that cross and died for us. He paid the payment for sin because the wages of sin is death. He took his perfect life to the cross for each and every single one of us. In order to be right with God, our sins had to be paid for. Somebody had to account for our sins. But because we are impure, we can't take an impure sacrifice to God. God can't accept that because he's holy, he's clean, he's perfect. We're not. Somebody had to come do it for us. Jesus did it. The beautiful thing about the gospel is Jesus didn't stay dead. Because guess what? A lot of great men in human history died for a right cause. Not Jesus. Not only did he die, he came back to life. Jesus rose from the grave three days after, revealed himself to be sovereign, revealed himself to be the one that can defeat death and sin, revealed himself to be God in the flesh, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Hey, that's the guy that we're celebrating this morning. Every single Sunday. That is the one whom we sing to with joy and with a loud noise. That is the one because of what he's done for us we can serve with gladness. That is the one that we can be thankful for. And in our thanksgiving we can truly worship him because we are thankful for what he has done. And we worship him for who he is. Inspiration that leads to transformation. It takes us to a place where all we can do is thank God for what he has done and worship him for who he is. So I, I said all of this, but what's, what do we have to do? Million dollar question. Okay, Marquis, you're saying everything great, but man, like I got to do something about this, right? Tell me what I need to do to get to a place where I can do that. Here's what it is. I think it needs to start with recalibrating our worship. We need to recalibrate our worship. We need to rethink how we understand worship. We need to rethink how we understand Thanksgiving. We need to go back and understand who God is so that we can authentically worship him. It starts with this recalibration to understand that it's not because of my circumstances, but I worship him because he is worthy. So how do we recalibrate this? Two quick things, because I'm running out of time. Number one, preach to yourself the good news of the gospel. That's how you begin to recalibrate, to remind yourself the good news of the gospel, to remind yourself of the cross, to remind yourself of the person and life of Jesus. And secondly, to grow in God's word every single day. Because guess what? You can't worship the God if you don't know him. You can't worship the Lord if you don't know him can't worship a God you do not know. So we need to recalibrate our worship by preaching the good news and by picking up the book every single day and reading it and growing in his word. Some of us might be on different levels of Bible reading, that's okay, but you don't know God if you don't read this. This is God's revelation to us. We grow in God's word so that we can know him and recalibrate our worship. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you because you have given us life. You are sovereign, the creator of the universe. You are the good shepherd. Because of that understanding and knowledge of who you are, we can do things with joy and with gladness and with thanksgiving. An inspiration, a knowledge of who you are that leads to a transformation in our own lives. I pray that you help us all to worship you better, to worship you greater, to worship you louder, to worship you on a greater scale than we already are right now. 
to be able, despite the circumstances in our lives, to have this joy and to have this gladness in our worship and in our deeds. Give us the strength and give us the heart, give us the mind to be able to do that by remembering the cross and by growing in your word. I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we continue to worship and we're going to give thanks. So we're going to put this to the test right now. Let's have a joyful noise as we continue singing and worshiping the Lord.
Church family, as we prepare our minds and our hearts to enter this week, may we do so with thanksgiving, with a joyful noise, with gladness. Brother, thank you for sharing today, man. Appreciate you. And cannot wait to see what God continues to do in your life. And in light of that, family, as this Christmas season starts, the world's looking for hope. They're looking for, for a reason to celebrate and to praise. May they find it when we go to work. May they see it in us, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, because we've learned that in light of the inspiration of God's life, our lives have therefore been transformed. Pray that we would live with that this week. Cornerstone family, we love you. God bless you. And we will see you again next week. And God bless everybody. Have a great, great Sunday. Take care.